Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Now we're going to discuss the management of stage 4 metastatic estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And we're back with Dr. Mark Lipman, chairman of medicine, University of Miami. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Okay. Let's take the scenario now where a woman presents, or a man presents to you with breast cancer that has spread to other parts of the body. What happens to that patient? Well, a woman who's got, or a man, with metastatic breast cancer is eminently treatable. Mm -hmm. um, many patients will respond wonderfully to multiple therapies, and some patients won't. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you have to answer a variety of questions. <clears throat> One, what is the patient interested in? What are their goals mm -hmm. for therapy? A 98-year-old may feel differently mm -hmm. from a 33-year-old. That seems obvious, but it may not always be the way you think. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need to know what you're dealing with, so you need to stage the breast cancer and look carefully. You need to know in which spots it has cropped mm -hmm. up. You need to know whether or not it is symptomatic or not, because sometimes symptoms <coughs> excuse me, are best treated with a local therapy in addition to a systemic treatment that can get into every mm -hmm. nook and cranny of a body. Someone who has a localized area of significant pain whatever other treatments they have may need some surgical or radiation therapy mm. intervention. Of course it's critical to know if the tumor is estrogen receptor positive or not mm -hmm. <clears throat> because if possible we would certainly like to treat cancers with hormone therapies mm -hmm. because in general, not always, but in general they are much better tolerated and easy to take. They don't require needles, they don't have side effects that people mm -hmm. dread like hair loss mm -hmm. and things like that. But all of those things need to put, be put into, a, in, into an equation. And of course, the patient is critical. She's allowed to make important decisions about what she's interested in and what her goals are. When would you choose chemotherapy over hormonal therapy? So in general, unless the tumor is so rapidly advancing that one feels that you have to get a response within a few days, if the tumor is hormone receptor positive, I would almost invariably opt for a hormone therapy first. As I said, they're better tolerated. When patients respond to hormone therapies, the responses on average are substantially longer than to chemotherapies, and occasionally very much longer. There isn't a person treating breast cancer uh, who's done a lot of it, who hasn't treated patients with a hormone therapy and had the patient respond for 5, 10, or 20 years. So certainly that's a clear option that you'd want to explore if you could. I see. <clears throat> There's actually a, an intravenous form of hormonal therapy called Faslodex. Would you please explain what that is? It's not intravenous. It's given by injection. Oh, it, it's, it's, it's an intramuscular injection. So there are drugs that are called antiestrogens like tamoxifen, but there are drugs that are even more potent as antiestrogens. They're called pure antiestrogens and Faslodex is one of them. Mm. Uh, Fulvestrant is its uh, generic name. It's very active, it works very well. Uh, it requires a monthly injection, uh, which is something you'd like to avoid if you could, but it's not the world's worst treatment, uh, mm -hmm. and it works very effectively. Can. Now, I know we discussed this in the previous video, but just for our patients that have not seen that, what is tamoxifen again? So, breast cancer grows when it's hormone dependent because estrogens interact with a protein called the estrogen receptor and that receptor protein triggers responses in the breast cancer that allow it to grow. Tamoxifen is a drug which binds to the receptor and sets off a series of responses in the tumor that are very different from those that would be evoked by estrogen. It's not quite an anti-estrogen it, but it certainly acts that way, and tumors treated with tamoxifen that are responsive to it will complete, can completely melt away. I see. What about the concerns that it can cause blood clots or endometrial cancer? Well, there is no treatment for breast cancer that does not have risks associated with benefits. Mm -hmm. Different patients will have more or less likelihood of certain risks. Mm -hmm and or different fears of certain risks. But almost invariably the worst risk is progressive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So a woman who's got metastatic disease rarely has the option of, well, I'll just do nothing, because doing nothing is not going to turn out well. Mm -hmm. 
the risk of blood clots with tamoxifen is correct, it's real, but it's no greater than being on an oral contraceptive. So for a relatively younger, thinner, active woman who has a history of taking oral contraceptives safely or been through a pregnancy safely, tamoxifen is likely to be very safe. Yeah. For a woman who's older, obese, sedentary, has had a history of DVTs, tamoxifen is a very spicy meatball and mm -hmm. perhaps wouldn't be my first choice for exactly those reasons. What about aromatase inhibitors? I apologize. What are those again? So women <coughs> produce estrogens <coughs> from precursors that the adrenal gland produces, which in the rest of the body are converted into estrogens by an enzyme called aromatase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a woman on an aromatase inhibitor can have her estrogen concentrations reduced to almost undetectable levels. Even in a postmenopausal woman who has lower concentrations of estrogens, there's still more than enough estrogen to stimulate a breast cancer. So an aromatase inhibitor in that setting further lowers her estrogen concentrations and can be very useful, and aromatase inhibitors have no association with blood clots or endometrial cancer, so that's a good thing. Uh, but they are associated with um, uh, a set of symptoms of bone and joint complaints, which can be troubling for some women, and occasionally serious enough that you have to stop the therapy and I do see. something else. Like Fazlodex, as you mentioned earlier. I see. What if your patient doesn't have appetite? How do you address that situation? Um, so, first of all, breast cancer is not associated with wasting and weight loss. Some cancers are. Some cancers you see uh, people who've lost tons of weight, but breast cancer is not. Mm. So if, almost never. So if a woman with breast cancer is losing weight, I want to know why. Mm -hmm. It's not just because she has breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Is she not eating because she has involvement of her liver or some internal organ and doesn't want to eat? She's nauseated. Mm -hmm. Is she not eating because she's depressed? I mean, I would want to explore that because weight loss is not a feature of patients with metastatic breast cancer. It's very different from, for example, lung cancer or very different from pancreatic cancer where weight loss may be common mm -hmm. and is caused by humors or substances produced by the tumor. Breast cancer doesn't do that, almost never. I see. How do you know that the treatment you're rendering is working? What, what do you check? <clears throat> you check whatever you can check. Usually, when a patient has recurred, it's pretty easy to see it. You can either feel a lump, or you can see it on a chest x-ray, or you can image it in some way, or the patient has symptoms. If a patient says, I have bone pain, and, and since you started me on that therapy, I feel like a million dollars, I don't need to spend lots of money on a PET scan mm -hmm. to know that she's mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. I, I think some tests are overutilized, and, and clinical judgment can be very helpful. That being said, aside from clinical judgment and talking and examining, regular x-rays and CAT scans and MRIs can help. There are blood markers which are no good for detecting breast cancer, mm -hmm. but they're good for following breast cancer, mm -hmm. particularly when there aren't easy things to measure. Mm -hmm. So if you get them every month or so and they're going this way, that's a good thing. And certainly, I've never seen a patient whose markers were consistently going that way who is getting worse. Mm -hmm. So that can be helpful as well. I see. Well, there are some bone-protecting agents, such as bisphosphonates or denosumab. When do you use those? For every <coughs> patient with metastatic breast cancer who doesn't have a direct contraindication. Mm, I see. Okay. Because for women with metastatic breast cancer, eventually most will get bone disease. Bone disease, while not fatal by itself, is very uncomfortable. It can be debilitating with fractures. And the data that show that these drugs that toughen up bones can prevent and or delay or ameliorate bone recurrences are completely set in stone. So I think they should be part of the management of every woman with metastatic breast cancer. Let's assume that the patient has metastatic breast cancer, but the, the breast cancer itself is still in the breast. Would you remove that or would you leave that in? So some women can prevent, present with breast cancer mm -hmm. in their breast and have metastatic disease. It's called the stage four presentation. And in general, I feel that there are very strong women reasons for managing the breast as well. Mm -hmm. Even if the patient may not be completely curable, the reasons are twofold. One, 
there are lots of ways to deal with metastatic breast cancer, but having a visible tumor that's progressing on the chest wall is no way to have any quality of life. So I don't, so even if a woman may be <coughs> facing a bad prognosis, I feel strongly that the breast should be managed just from a cosmetic point mm -hmm, of view. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they, they, it is controversial, and there's no randomized study here, but there are data that strongly <laughs> suggest that removing the primary tumor improves the prognosis. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm fully aware of all the reasons that those <coughs> studies may be uh, confounded. But there are animal data that show that, and there are other tumors that, that you know of, for example, uh, occasional melanomas and certainly renal cell carcinomas in which the removal of the primary tumor can have an effect at a distance on the metastases. So uh, in general, I am in favor of treating the primary tumor as well. Have you ever been confronted with a situation in which the family does not want you to tell the patient the prognosis or the outcome? Sure. How do you handle that? Um, first of all, I think it's a myth. I think most patients get it. They may not want to talk about it, but if you're being treated in a cancer center <coughs> and the word breast cancer is being used, I mean, it's very rare that mm -hmm. people have no idea. You know, the era of saying you have a benign growth, which we're going to treat with, I mean, that's just gone. As I've said earlier, I think it's very important to give patients information in, al in, in bundles that they can incorporate mm -hmm. and use. But I think that trying to keep a secret from a patient is terrible. And they know, and if a patient thinks you're lying to them, you have no trust. Mm -hmm. And as I say to my patients, if I tell you it's this bad, you know it's not worse. Mm -hmm. You know that we're straight. And I establish that level of trust. And I have had once or twice in my career a family say, well, we're going somewhere else. But I think ethically as a physician, I must treat pa patients in ways that I consider to be in the patient's interest. The family's interest is important, but the patient's interest is first. I see. What is a clinical trial, and do you recommend that? So a clinical trial is a way of evaluating new treatments, fundamentally. There are lots of different kinds. There are four different uh, uh, phases of clinical trials, as you know. In general, there is a time and a place for them. Uh, we wouldn't know anything that we know about breast cancer were it not for clinical trials, so I'm generally in favor of them. Mm -hmm. I generally think that there are data that show that patients get, compared to not in trials, that they get slightly better care. Sometimes it may be the only way to get a new or experimental mm -hmm. drug, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm generally in favor of them. But for some pa patients, they have a complete diversion to the idea, and you have to respect that. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, and I can't emphasize it enough, we wouldn't have had this set of presentations where I'm telling you what to do mm -hmm. were it not for the brave and courageous women willing to be part of clinical trials. Sure. <clears throat> I know patients with metastatic breast cancer can live for a long time, but at which point do you recommend palliative care or hospice? Uh, when it's the right time. I realize that sounds like a dumb thing, but there are times where I don't really feel that I have the likelihood of prolonging life, mm -hmm. and all I am likely to do is add to suffering. And I think that those are times in which you want to not abandon patients. I never do that. Mm -hmm. You want them to be comfortable to be able to, in a way that is safe and secure, to conduct the business of dying, to, mm -hmm. to be with their families and children and friends and uh, achieve some kind of closure on their lives. Um, I think that those discussions go very differently in different families and in different cultures and in different languages and I have no easy answer for that, but I think it is a dereliction of duty as a physician, as an oncologist, not to face and cross those bridges with patients when it's the right time. I see. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for watching, and we hope this has been educational for you.